All right, so welcome everyone back to the room. Um, we are continuing on, but with a kind of a, a looking backwards in terms of biogeosciences across our discipline. Um, our first speaker is Patrick Krill, um, and thank you for coming. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, how does any of this work? You're going to use right here, the up and down. Up and down right there? Yep. All right. Uh, this will be a little bit different. Uh, I want, I want to talk about uh, the, the, philosophical and un, uh, the philosophical and moral un, underpinnings that, that is driving an impetus in the development of our, our discipline. Uh, it, it comes out of decades of conversations with these people, especially uh, Hildred and I have been talking about this for about five year, 50 years. All right, let me, let me start to just put us on the same page. I'm more of a biogeochemist. Biogeosciences is, you know, a broader field and fits in it. And biogeochemistry, because of our approach to the chemical and physical relationships uh, that we might have with the planet, makes AGU a real, you know, a natural home for these kinds of things that we're doing. Now, the important thing here is just to, to give you a notion of, of what my definition is. And then there are two implications of that that, that lead to these, these notions of the... Uh, Lemma one, lemma two, and the most importantly is at the uh, uh, is this idea that uh, the character and habitability of the planet. This is, is this is something that's going to drive our future as well as our past, and so I want to try to connect this to uh, uh, where is this? There it is. There is ah, here's an early experiment in biogeochemistry by by Priestley. Um, I, I tend to do it with a, you know, it, it, it freaks out the second year students to be doing it with mice, so do it with a candle. Uh, but, it, <clears throat> but it's an expression of this idea that, and how early this developed in our, our whole history of chemistry, our whole history of, of our relationship to the planet uh, has to do with these kinds of notions. And this is just an illustration of Lavoisier's sort of notion of the wonderful connection of the flow of uh, the three kingdoms. And in their term, it wasn't, you know, they hadn't figured out archaea yet, but we've got animal, animal mineral, and vegetable. And, and this evolutionary notion is really important. And uh, we're going to take a, a step beyond that now and talk about uh, even the founding of AGU. After the, the First World War, there was a, you know, there was this, you know, essentially discombobulation, this, these cultural forces that, uh, that the people were responding to. And the foundation of AGU was sort of a reflection of this, this cultural of, of realignment of things like uh, uh, this, this internationalism, the League of Nations, right? Uh, this and the American Geophysical Union starts out as the American Committee going to the International Union. We're going to come back to this too eventually. And this is just a real quick notion that you can find this information, this, this lovely review by uh, Tom Gradle that's available at the AGU website. Now, post World War II, now it seems like these, this, it's uh, connected to this, this rather, you know human activity of, of making war on their planet. But in the 50s, we had the International Geophysical Year, and then that uh, AGU was really central in the design and implementation of it. And what's really curious to me is in the 1960s, uh, Alvin and Teros-1 were both launched within a couple of years of each other. I find this really interesting because now our observational constraints on uh, of the planet itself now are shifting, are changing, you know, and what kind of disciplinary uh, organization do we need? What is that philosophy that's going to allow us uh, uh, to truly exploit these kind of, the, 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 exploit this observational uh, uh, capacity that has expanded and exploded in us. We saw some amazing things earlier in the, the, the previous session about a lot of that. So now they're launched. Who's going to be able to take care of that? 
who are, who are we prepared philosophically and emotionally, uh, uh, morally, in order to, to really exploit our abilities for this? And uh, I, I'd say, yeah, I'd say it would have to be biogeosciences and biogeochemistry. We are a central discipline in our understanding of the planet and our relationships to it. Uh, we've all heard of uh, Vernadsky as being, you know, sort of the initiator of this notion of biogeochemistry. But this, this coincidental meeting of these guys, again, now we're going back to the 1920s, to this post-war period, where again, we're trying to organize our, our cultural imperatives in some interesting ways, right? So now these guys, it's the same pressure, it's the same culture. We'll never be able to escape our poetics, right? So we get people like Vernadsky uh, and borrowing, these guys are borrowing back and forth. These guys uh, think of themselves as intense empiricists, right? They're not, uh, you know, we've got a geologist, we have a Théa de Deschardins et Bois Le Roi. They were all in Paris at the same time, given this post-war period, um, and they borrowed back and forth, sort of developing this idea of the biosphere and its relationship to the geosphere and Vernadsky uh, parlance. That's, that's an evolutionary step. Now, he was, you know, I talked about uh, Voller in the, the abstract to, to this talk about um, biogenesis and abiogenesis, and that's a very important difference between them. Now, what's more interesting to me, in a sense, is this notion of the noosphere of Teilhard, uh, of Teilhard and uh, Le Roy. That this is, again, it's, a, it's an equivalent sphere. It's an existence sphere of knowledge that encircles the Earth. In our understanding, as our understanding grows and uh, develops, you know, it also affects the planet at the same time. So, you know, we're so intimately tied to that. And so they are thinking of this as an evolutionary kind of uh, uh, process. Uh, Teilhard was, uh, and uh, the possibility of abiogenesis is tied up in this idea of the noosphere and uh, how we're uh, developing intellectually. Um, the biogeochemistry comes into our parlance a little bit more through Hutchison, and he's sort of ecologized uh, more so. But again, that's also related to this notion of the, the, the biogenesis. But, all right, this is 1920. This is the same pressures that are driving us uh, to get to the present day. And then another post-war period. This is after the, sec uh, after the Vietnam War period. And finally, AGU is incorporated as a society. And, and we start to look at, at the kind of people that have contributed and have led our section in biogeosciences. These are all tremendous physical scientists. You know, and it's, you know, we have been incredibly lucky. And they're, they're all pretty much biogeochemists, not biogeosciences guys. So I kind of like to say that that's our central discipline. But, uh, and, uh, and it's developing, it's continuing, people like Margaret uh, Torn. And so, and you can never underestimate the efforts that Diane McKnight put into the development of the biogeosciences session. Now we had a home, and biogeochemistry is more comfortable in an environment with these, with, with the geologists, with our understanding of earth system sciences. It's, it's uh, just amazing, and it's, it's just a fantastic organization, a fantastic union, and it's something, uh, again, I can't, oh, in conclusion, this is a letter now, after, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Bauer, who was the second president of the AGU, after their maybe third meeting, about uh, many groups, it appeared slightly related, right? But our union is held together and promises still to hold together. Now this is critical because now we're faced with challenges on this planet that we had never seen before as a species, right? And so this is an all hands on deck kind of situation where our, it's in our development of the sciences, in our development of the understanding in that relationship with the planet as that noosphere expands, 
that we have to, we really have to contribute as a group. And it's our moral responsibility to do so. And, you know, what else can I say? But, you know, I'm, you know uh, tomorrow's, tomorrow's past is, is today, right? So that's, the, thank you for letting me blather on. <laughs> Oh, I, um, I, uh, Elise, our, our, our president, has uh, gave me some information here that uh, there will be the leadership of the, the section will be hanging around in the poster session with Margaret Torn and uh, Elise, and the poster number is uh, B43M3107. So right please come right by after lunch. right after lunch, folks. It's at 43. All right, thank you very much. Okay, and Tim Lyons will uh, take us back three billion years. Yeah, well, that's right. Okay, well, thanks, thanks very much uh, to the organizers. It's an honor to be part of this. And uh, I've set a pretty big agenda for myself to discuss three billion years of Earth history in, in eight minutes. I did the math, that's six million years per second of presentation time. And, and in telling you that, I lost the Triassic, and I apologize for that. Um, so I, I, I'm also going to mention a little bit about Vernatsky, who's um, become more and more part of my world as I learn more and more about his important contributions. Uh, he, of course, popularized the idea of the biosphere, didn't coin the term, but many people think popularized it, and it recognized that life is a geological force that shapes the Earth. Um, he established the field of biogeochemistry, as we just heard, and he realized that life is, again, this geological force that, among other things, can change the content of its atmosphere, something that we take for granted now, but that was really uh, a landmark discovery uh, almost 100 years ago. And he was one of the first to recognize that oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are linked strongly to biological processes, which, of course, motivates much of what many of us do, uh, including the life the search for life on exoplanets and biosignature gases within the atmospheres of those worlds. And so I'll start with really what many of us agree on now, and that is this idea of a, of a two-step oxygenation history of Earth. And this is a figure that Don Canfield published in 2005, and it argues for low oxygen during the Archean, and then a step up um, in the early Paleoproterozoic, and then another step that's not terribly well understood, as I'll talk about in a second, in the Neoproterozoic. Um, and, and of course, in, in the past decade plus, we've come to know the GOE very well, the great oxidation event by the loss of mass-independent sulfur fractionation, one of the major discoveries in our field. And so we all have our different oxygen curves, and you can nuance them to death, but they all, characterize, they all carry through this idea of the two-step processes, and, um, or the two-step shift. And that two-step um, uh, uh, manifestation is, is, is seen in many different geochemical records. Here I'm showing you uranium enrichment in shales, but I could show you many different trace metals and iodine and carbonates, and almost anything that we've analyzed shows this same basic pattern. So we've come a long way. Uh, there are many things that we agree upon, but there are tremendous opportunities that still exist. We agree on this general two-step GOE and neoproterozoic oxidation event. But that's really about all that we really agree on. We don't really understand and, and agree on when oxygenesis began biologically, um, and those opinions differ by hundreds of millions of years. What happened after the initial rise of oxygen, whether there was the famous Loma Gundi interval that many people uh, accept where oxygen rose and then dropped again, the importance of plate tectonics, uh, when patterns as we understand them today began and the consequences. Uh, oxygen and primary production through the important boring billion, the mid-proterozoic er, er, um, interval. Nutrient relationships that play such a central role in controlling, modulating oxygen levels. Climate drivers and consequences, including the snowball earth episodes. Greenhouse gas scenarios that kept our earth habitable in the face of a of a, a fundamental shift in atmospheric redox, an interior that was cooling, a sun that was brightening, the feedbacks associated um, with with these greenhouse gases, the timing and cause of the, of the Neoproterozoic oxidation event. And then most importantly, something that I'm very much involved in and many other people is the relationship between life and the environment and in particular oxygen. There's, there's very little consensus on 
the drivers, the cause and effect relationships in, that, in those regards. Plate tectonics were all over the place. We have to understand when continents formed, why they formed, when they began to interact, the importance of plate tectonics in recycling nutrients, for example. Uh, this idea of, of environmental and, and biological coevolution. Why did eukaryotes appear when they did? What were the fundamental steps in eukaryotic ecology and eukaryotic life? What happened in the latest portions of the Proterozoic? And then the all-important question of, did animals appear because of the rise of oxygen in the Neoproterozoic? Many people think not, that it was really just the, t the, the, uh, the protraction, the, 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 um, the rate of, of evolution amongst complex organisms. And so nutrients play a central role in many of these things. In 1998, Don Canfield asked us to consider the possibility that the deep ocean stayed anoxic uh, for a long period after the great oxidation event. Ariel and Andy Knoll published an important paper suggesting that much of the ocean may have been sulfitic, that could have pulled down trace metals, that may have affected fixed nitrogen availability. And now many of us think that the deep ocean for mo almost all of Earth's history was dominated by anoxic and iron-rich conditions, which would play an important role in controlling phosphorus cycling and its availability through time. And so now there are observational data that support many different kinds of models that suggest that phosphorus may have been a limiting nutrient throughout the, throughout the Precambrian with, tr with, with trace metals and nitrogen also um, contributing to those controls. And so one of the things that I, I feel that we all need to ask ourselves is, are we really a fully integrated research community? We can all generate these Venn diagrams and see where we fall on them. But I find that in my own work, that as molecular approaches become increasingly important in the questions that we ask, that it's hard to do all things well. And there's often a kind of leapfrogging where someone will take an ocean model and apply that to their molecular view of the world. And by the time that paper is published, the ocean model has already evolved to something else. And so I think that there needs to be more synergism, more cohesive, real-time interactions amongst these groups. And I also think that we all need to think big as we try to justify the things that we do. I, I, in my career, the stage that I'm in now, I always try to think of new reasons for why what I do might be important, why other people should care. And I've been extremely, extremely fortunate to venture into the world that Mary Wojtek talked to us about today. And that is taking alternative Earth scenarios, models for the early Earth, and envisioning the atmospheres and the biosignature bio compositions of those atmospheres and how that knowledge of the Earth as a, as, a, as a very diverse planetary system might inform our search for life on exoplanets. And so we start from the rock record, and then it goes through a wide range of model space where ultimately we're thinking of the mid-proterozoic and what its atmosphere may have been like, and whether biosignature gases in that atmosphere would be detected by a next generation telescope like Louvoir or Habex. And so it's not that we're looking for Earth necessarily, but we're trying to understand the pieces of a planetary system that can maintain habitability against a wide array of change, and the Earth has given us an extraordinary array of these alternative planetary systems. And so one of the things that we've done um, is considered the possibility of seasonality as an important biosignature, not just CO2, but O2 and ozone because of its, its, the ease of detection of ozone with the UV capability that we hope will be on some of these telescopes. And so I'll end by saying that uh, while we've come a, a long distance in the 100 years of, of AGU and the more recent times of biogeosciences, I think that we need to continue, as Vernatsky would have asked us to do, to think broadly and really substantively and very interactively about interdisciplinary research. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you all in advance for staying on time. Speaking of time and clocks, uh, Sue Trumbor is going to give us a radiocarbon clock. Okay, thanks, Dirk. I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, we've known about isotopes for about 100 years, and I'm going to talk about my favorite isotopes, my favorite isotope. Uh, while they find my talk, which is radiocarbon. Um, and radiocarbon is important because it's taught us a lot about, uh, it's our clock for the carbon cycle, it's taught us a lot about the Earth system um, for the last 50,000 years. And it's also one of the few Nobel Prizes that's been coming to uh, an Earth science-related field. 
Um, so we all know that radiocarbon is an unstable um, isotope. It will decay with a half-life of about 5,700 years. So the only reason we have it on Earth is because it's constantly be cre being created by cosmogenic interactions with uh, the upper atmosphere and with rocks at the Earth's surface. And um, using the spread of radiocarbon from the atmosphere, where it's created um, and quickly becomes CO2, and then you know enters the Earth's carbon cycle, we've learned about the um, timing of deep ocean circulation. We've learned about the long time scales of peat accumulation. Um, we've learned about with the cosmogenic production in minerals at the Earth's surface, we've learned about Earth's surface processes like weathering, landscape evolution. And from the calibration curve of radiocarbon, the changes in radiocarbon um, in the atmosphere of the past, we've learned about even things like um, uh, uh, the geomagnetic field and its variations over time and the changes in the past carbon cycle. So, but this is on time scales of tens of hundreds to tens of thousands of years, just given the nature of, of what we can measure. And um, there is a second way to make radiocarbon, um, which is humans make it when they make their own nuclear reactions. And uh, bomb radiocarbon essentially gave us a global isotopic spike of the global of the carbon cycle. Um, starting in the early 1960s, and um, we have learned a lot about more rapid carbon cycling from that, um, in particular just mass balancing where that bomb radiocarbon went um, has uh, been a, you know, kind of a major control in our understanding of the carbon cycle. I just want to point out we have measurements of what went into the troposphere um, throughout the bomb period, we have estimates of how much total radiocarbon was created. And we had these two amazing um, endeavors, Geosex in the um, mid-1980s and the World Ocean Circulation Experiment that gave us snapshots of how much bomb radiocarbon had entered the ocean. Like the carbon cycle up until recently, we did the biosphere by difference. And I think we still have a lot to do in terms of understanding the mass balance of this isotope spike. Um, and um, one of the concerns I have is that, that we don't really necessarily have a plan for the next uh, geosex or WOS. Uh, there's Clivar, but um, you know, is the funding really there? And uh, also, we still have not yet, as a biosphere community, kind of come up with our own bottom-up estimates the major change for uh, this century or, or close to the last 50 year, 40 years has been um, the evolution from waiting for radiocarbon to decay uh, to be able to measure it to measuring it uh, individual atoms by accelerator mass spectrometry. And so we've gone from the uh, things of Libby's time, these large uh, gas counters or liquid scintillation counters, where we had to process grams of material to make a measurement to what we have today with accelerator mass spectrometers that's, um, you know, standard sizes are less than a milligram now, um, down to a few micrograms of carbon. So we've also gone from being able to measure hundreds of samples a year to thousands of samples a year. And what that means um, is a big challenge, I think, that faces not just uh, us, but, but all of the Earth's science community, which is the proliferation of data and how do we manage it organize it and deal with it. So this is just a graph of the number of papers published with either radiocarbon as a title or a keyword. And you can see that there's, uh, we've gone from you know a few papers um, around the time of Libby to uh, more than 1,000 papers per year now. Um, and, and it's tremendous growth because of accelerator mass spectrometry. So how do we try to organize these data? I'd, I'd argue it's still a big challenge for our community. Um, the Calibration curve people have always had the uh, INCAL efforts. Um, there's the ocean carbon data system that, because only a few institutions measured the, the WOS and um, uh, uh, geo, uh, geo traces samples, um, that, that those are pretty well organized because only a few places are involved. But for things like understanding organic matter, there are these nascent, uh, I would say, more community and uh, bottom-up efforts. There's Tim Eglinton's group's uh, mosaic um, to look at sediments. There's the fractal also headed um, in Tim's group in, in ETH Zurich. And then um, I'm partly here as um, 
to talk about the International Soil Radiocarbon Database, which is a, also a community effort uh, between our institute and the PAL Center uh, at USGS. And that's being incorporated into the International Soil Carbon Network so that there may be a place to organize and have a data repository that could be used for future synthesis products. I just wanted to show a graph of Heather Gravens. This is uh, what's, you often say, well, what's the future of the bomb spike? Um, and it really depends on what people do. So this is the, you know, the almost doubling of radiocarbon in the atmosphere. And as we go forward, we're about to pass in this decade, in the next couple of years, we'll go below zero per mil again. So we'll be back at levels of 1895 uh, for radiocarbon in the atmosphere. And if we keep burning fossil fuels at the same rate, you know, we'll start to not be able to tell the difference between something that's a few years old and something that's more than 100 years old. And so we need, uh, we have still a lot to learn, but we really need two things. We really need archived samples and we need to make sure that all the data that have been measured are in places where we can find them in the future so we don't lose this um, time series that the bomb radiocarbon have given us. And those need to be put into global assessments of the bomb radiocarbon. Um, you know, we also need to keep looking at where this spike went into the future with future surveys for ocean and I would say soil and an ecosystem radiocarbon. We need to do a biosphere synthesis with upscaling products that can be used, both of these as um, stringent tests for our car coupled carbon climate models. And um, I'm gonna end with a blatant uh, advertisement for the short course in radiocarbon and ecology and earth system science that'll be held in August in uh, UC Irvine. And also for the book that I, my co-authors, uh, Ted, Sure, and Ellen Juffel and I have put out. So thank you very much. Next speaker, John Miller, will tell us about measuring atmospheric CO2. Great, thank you. So radiocarbon 14C is also one of my favorite isotopes, but I'll talk about some stable isotopes in this talk. Um, measured from the atmosphere later on in the talk, C13. Um, but first I just wanted to um, thank the organizers for including me and also to give the perspective from the atmosphere and at our lab in NOAA, these are the sites that we, at which we measure um, CO2 and a wide variety of other greenhouse gases. And actually, for those of you who were here in the morning, you'll see the exact same thing that PEP somehow um, went into my mind and stole my, uh, my graph that Andy Jacobson in our lab made. But um, nonetheless, it's so pretty, I'll show it again. Um, and as you know, th this shows the uh, strong rise of CO2 over time. The fact that in the southern hemisphere, we don't have much of a seasonal cycle, but we do have a very strong seasonal cycle in the north. And also, as our network evolved, we started measuring more and more samples in the northern hemisphere um, where really the action was, that is, where the terrestrial bias, where we could make CO2 measurements near the centers of action, which is the terrestrial biosphere. The ocean is certainly important on the global level, but the terrestrial biosphere um, is where a lot of the signal is. Um, and one of the thing, the first order thing, however, that we can do with the data from that global network is form global averages. Here's the Mauna Loa curve, the cyan trend through that um, famous sawtooth seasonal pattern. If we take the first derivative of that trend, um, of, that, of that trend, we get the growth rate of CO2. That's the annual accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere every year from an almost 50 year record now. Um, and then the surprising thing, of course, that many of you know is that if we compare this with the emissions of fossil fuels, um, we see that only about half of what we emit in fossil fuel ends up in the atmosphere, and the gap between the black line and the red line are the total amount of sink, of uh, total amount of carbon that we've emitted that's absorbed at the surface of the earth that is both the land and the ocean. And I think this is really a, 
a fundamental thing that the atmospheric data has, has shown to us, the extent of the sinks. Um, and as we moved more to a more sophisticated way of looking at our global network data, um, and, and other people like uh, Dave Keeling did similar things, but you know, I'll focus here on the seminal Peter of our, uh, our group chiefs, Peter Tons, from now almost a 30-year-old paper, a study. Um, you see that when they modeled, or here are the observations which show north, north to south about a two part per million gradient in the annual mean. However, when they tried to model that gradient using atmospheric transport, the best estimates of land use change, fossil fuels, and a roughly neutral biosphere, they got a much bigger gradient, and they concluded that the only reasonable way to reconcile the model with the observation was to add a substantial sink of carbon in the northern hemisphere. Furthermore, ocean PCO2 observations strongly suggested that this sink had to be on land. And I think we really can't underestimate the influence that this paper and other papers like this had in guiding not just the for us as atmospheric community, but within the larger carbon cycle community as a whole, in terms of where to look for the missing sink. Um, certainly, we know that there's a lot in the tropics as well, but, but this really showed the power of how atmospheric data could, could guide our discussion and really start to link communities between the atmosphere and the biosphere. Um, we've started to do more sophisticated things with our global network data using the carbon tracker. Um, 3D data assimilation model. This gives us more highly resolved land fluxes and ocean fluxes. Well, I'll just highlight one of the more significant results that we've gotten in the last um, years, which is that we see at the very end of the record around the 2015-16 El Nino, this is showing tropical flux anomalies that in the tropical belt we see a maximum of about 2 billion ton anomaly. Um, that's not over a, a year, that's the in instantaneous uh, maximum. Um, so, but still, that's a really big anomaly of carbon uh, being released from the biosphere uh, that we're seeing from our observations. Um, one of the more interesting things that we've done in the last several years is develop some offshoots of the main carbon tracker model. This study was led by Wouter Peters in the Netherlands using our CO2 and delta C13 data to actually solve for the isotopic discrimination pattern uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere, this, this parameter delta, which is the photosynthetic, photosynthetic fractionation parameter, and it's strongly related to drought. But fundamentally, what this graph says is that as global, as northern hemisphere NEE decreases here, the smaller is less of a sink that we see that there's less drought, and one of the strongest results from this paper was that a lot of biosphere models commonly used in Earth system models didn't have anything like the sensitivity that we see here. Um, if we zoom in now, some other studies that we've been do doing more recently, this right one in the Amazon in collaboration with our close collaborator, Luciana Gatti in Brazil, using a regional analysis of CO2 data using aircraft vertical profiles, showed a very strong difference between um, CO2 uh, uptake, uh, lack of CO2 uptake during the 2010 drought and a recovery in 2011. Um, likewise, in North America, we see actually an El Nino response in the opposite direction, that is a more stronger sink during El Nino with the hypothesis that the North American sink during El Nino might compensate some of the tropical source but the theme here overall is that we're seeing through our data a very strong relationship between moisture and temperature anomalies at regional to continental scales and carbon flux. And this has big implications for our ability to use atmospheric data to help understand uh, carbon cycle models and their pr ability to predict the future. Um, you know, I'm just gonna skip the, the methane section for here. You can ask me about this later. And I just want to really emphasize the first bullet point here in the summary, which is that none of these would be available through um, campaign-style measurements as good as they are, like ATOM or HIPPO. Really, 
what is required for all of these results are very long-term sustained observations that are spread out globally. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Okay. Now it's time to get a little bit down and dirty with um, Oliver Chad, who's going to tell us about soils. Okay, so um, uh, soils, uh, of course, have been understood by farmers for um, a very long time, but from the perspective of science and particularly questions of, of uh, CO2 absorption from atmosphere, things like this, we actually have, um, uh, uh, we have a real problem with understanding soils, particularly from the perspective of the spatial distributions, as I'll get to um, later. So what I want to do today is, um, uh, start by contrasting where our thinking was perhaps 100 years ago um, uh, before Vernadsky and then uh, where we're thinking, how we're thinking about this today. So basically, um, <clears throat> uh, back uh, 100 years ago, we were thinking of soil as ground up plant material, dead plant material, and ground up dead rock. Um, uh, and, and then uh, over time, we began to understand that that plant material was actually um, being decomposed by bacteria, and then um, a lot of the organic matter was dead uh, bacteria material uh, instead, and had distinct properties separate from the uh, from from the actual plant material. Uh, in the same way, of course, we got to the point where we began to understand that uh, that the ground up rocks. Um, were not the geologic minerals, but they were secondary minerals that were being formed um, in the process of the decomposition of the rocks. And so, uh, so today we, we tend to think much more about soil as a membrane at the Earth's surface that uh, filters both um, water uh, and gases through it uh, and, and changes their properties. So essentially we, we have biospheric acids coming in uh, and we have, um, we, we have transformations going on within the soil uh, that actually then feed rivers with water that has different properties. Um, and if we, if we sort of uh, think about this in a little more detail, we can think that Hans Jenny told us about the fact that soils are, are composed of a series of, are, are sort of um, uh, dependent on a series of state factors that produce the particular soils that we find. And we can break those state factors into two, real, two components, really. One is a biological and a climatological component, um, uh, which essentially then drives uh, energy and mass transfers um, uh, <clears throat> uh, through the soil system. And in that context, we have these uh, atmospheric acids and uh, bioacids that are produced that then um, move through the soil under the influence of water flow and then react with rock minerals and, and the acids then are, um, are actually neutralized in the process. And so we have this, this um, huge uh, acid-base reaction that's driving the uh, transformations. Um, and so, uh, so water is, is critical to this process because uh, depending on the amount of water moving through the soil, we either have the, the products being produced ending up uh, um, accumulating within the soil or actually being washed into, uh, into rivers and, and, and to oceans. Okay, and then of course temperature plays a critical role as well as far as driving the biology. Um, so we have these, these uh, 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 energy components and then we have the, the earth component or the geological component which we can uh, characterize partly as a function of, of topography or relief, uh, which essentially drives the rate of physical and chemical erosion from the system. Um, and, and, and we can think of uh, lithology then, the type of rock as being resistant to physical and chemical uh, disturbance. Um, and we can think about minerals as being uh, uh, resistant to uh, different types of chemical weathering. So they have different resistances. Um, 
And if we put this in the context then of weathering and erosion processes, we can think of soil as being um, something that happens uh, when weathering is uh, equal to or greater than erosion. Um, but if uh, weathering is less than erosion, we end up with rock outcrop. Um, uh, so now, if we then take this another, uh, another step, and we think about this in, in, in the context of uh, what's now defined as critical zone thinking, um, we end up with uh, the fact that we really need to link um, ecology, hydrology, geology, and pedology all into an understanding of complex of, of behavior of, of this um, membrane in the, uh, um, in the context of complex earth landscapes. And this is something that's really different than atmospheric uh, processes and oceanic processes to a great extent because we have um, a tremendous, um, we, we, we don't have a very well mixed system. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of difference in mass um, properties across the landscape. And so, uh, so uh, one thing that's really critical for us to understand in this process is to think about how biotic feedback, so uh, plants in this case, actually uh, recycle both water and nutrients um, uh, back to the surface. They, they're pulling them out. So it's not just a gravitational one-way street that's driving this reaction that I, that I described. Um, and so, so, so these are, um, th this is sort of where we are today is, is, is really starting to uh, link uh, in, a in, in real landscapes, thinking about how all these processes that are both um, uh, solid materials moving off the landscape, but also liquid uh, and, and the solutes in, the, in that uh, liquid uh, and, and how they're moving. And this is really where the uh, critical zone concept comes in. Um, just a couple of words about uh, where I think we need to go in the future. I think that very clearly one of the one of the real weak points in our science is the fact that we don't have good pixelated understanding of of soil properties across landscapes to match up with the detail that we have in terms of lidar coverage, in terms of uh, 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 remote sensing uh, products for the surface. And so I think in the future we need to pixelate the, um, uh, the subsurface and certainly one way Estelle, uh, Estella talked this morning about the use of geophysical tools. Um, and, and we should be able to use those geophysical tools to tell us a fair amount about the soil properties um, in, in, a, in a continuous way. Um, uh, and so um, and then we can use uh, uh, LIDAR and other surface topographies to develop um, statistical uh, relationships between surface and subsurface properties. Um, we can also use then uh, this, um, uh, this bad stuff that we heard about this morning, the high spatial and spectral resolution data, um, to, uh, uh, to, to think about uh, actually developing transfer functions between what we can measure at the surface, like plant leaves, and uh, um, uh, and the subsurface properties. And so the, these data are, are basically foliar calcium and foliar phosphorus with respect to topographic position um, uh, at, at really fine scales. Uh, and so we can use the plants to tell us a lot. Um, so concluding then, uh, I, I think that um, uh, soil is an understudied resource uh, that is indeed critical, of course, to, our, uh, to planetary functioning. And uh, as in the past, our future really is going to depend on um, uh, in, um, uh, sort of integrating across a number of dis different disciplines um, in, in the use of uh, developing new tools. Thank you. Okay, our plumber for today will be Elise Morrison. Thank you. Um, and so, unfortunately, Tom couldn't be here today, so I'll be filling in for him. Can I? Yeah. Um, and 
And so um, what we really want to talk about today is a uh, history of our understanding of the land aquatic continuum and how anthropogenic effects have altered this and essentially replumbed the Earth's surface. So they, we've altered the uh, terrestrial aquatic continuum quite a bit. And then we'll look forward into some questions that may drive um, our understanding of this connectivity in the future. And so I'd like to thank Tom for putting together this talk and then also Mike Shields and Nick Ward for their contributions to this work as well. So we've already heard quite a bit about um, geo the founders of uh, biogeochemistry and also geochemistry, but we really wanted to highlight the uh, contributions that, um, say, Victor Goldschmidt um, uh, provided for the foundation of geochemistry, and also Seuss's work with the biosphere and that was then um, you know, it's built upon by Vernatsky. So um, these uh, critical uh, foundational um, thinkers really uh, promoted our understanding of uh, these processes and have allowed us to apply this, these concepts to uh, systems such as the terrestrial aquatic continuum. And so early on in our understanding of the terrestrial aquatic continuum was really based on uh, mineral and erosional fluxes. And so the hypsometric curve um, shown in Casina's 1920 work really uh, it broke down the earth into high and low points and sources and sinks of sediment uh, across the landscape and across the terrestrial aquatic continuum. And Deegan's really built upon this as well. And so these, work, these works really focused on these erosional fluxes um, relating to sediment transport across this continuum. And then we started to look in the geochemistry of this, um, particularly with Livingston's 1963 USGS report that really characterized the co composition of the constituents within major river waters uh, throughout the world. And so this starts to overlay the uh, geochemistry on top of the physical erosional processes in these basins. And this has continued on to this day with Milliman and Farnsworth's work. Um, and here you can see the total suspended solids estimated for uh, all uh, throughout the globe. And so um, as uh, this science progressed, we uh, started seeing more biologically relevant elements um, being studied, such as organic carbon, uh, such as in Schlesinger, Schlesinger's work, looking at annual river flow and carbon load, and really seeing the export of this material, um, bringing in the bio, biology of biogeochemistry. However, it was originally thought that rivers were neutral pipes, so they were pretty much con considered conduits between the land and ocean. And Cole's work really uh, showed that there are potential losses of CO2 and storages of sediment along this uh, continuum. And so this has really been transformational work in our understanding of organic uh, carbon cycling along these systems. And Blair and Aller's work have really then uh, refined this further by looking at passive versus active margins um, and organic carbon cycling along these margins. And this is further refined, these dynamic systems are further refined um, based on uh, the discharge that rivers really, um, ex uh, the discharge and export of rivers um, on uh, different time scales. So ep episodic hydrologic events can really either result in a, a, uh, a quick and rapid deposit of terrestrial dissolved organic matter onto the coastal systems, or it can result in more active uptake and storage um, if the residence time is longer. And so these, these works really have um, shown that there's a complex and dynamic um, cycling that occurs along the terrestrial aquatic continuum. And when we overlay the biologic communities um, and their impacts on organic matter, um, such as the work that Vinot uh, conducted in 1980, uh, we really see that biologic communities also change along this terrestrial aquatic continuum, and that can subsequently impact organic matter cycling along these systems. So where you see downstream communities that can be adapted to capitalize on the organic matter cycling inefficiencies of upstream communities. And so uh, these um, systems are highly connected, but uh, humans have really, re really resulted in um, kinks in this land aquatic continuum, resulting in aquatic critical zones that have really steep biogeochemical gradients. And so we can see this in sediment retention in large dam reservoirs that causes the starving of river deltas, which may um, promote uh, river delta loss over the course of, um, as climate change proceeds. And we see that climate change can have interactive effects on genes to biomes in Sheffer's paper recently. So these biologic communities that are overlaid on top of the 
um, atop of the river aquatic continuum, the terrestrial aquatic continuum, can really alter the biogeochemistry. And so organisms such as uh, vegetative communities can really alter watershed biogeochemistry. And as these organisms migrate, they may subsequently impact the biogeochemistry of the system. So as you have, say, marsh to mangrove transitions, or as you have benthic communities that shift uh, due to climate effects, we may see changes in watershed biogeochemistry, and we may see further interruption of that aquatic um, continuum, terrestrial aquatic continuum. And so as organisms move, there are also changes in the evolutionary drivers that impact um, communities. And so there may also be alterations in organismal genetic adaptation, which then can subsequently alter their function in the system, which can then impact biogeochemistry. And so some of the questions that we're interested in addressing is really how do these changes in communities in aquatic critical zones, um, how do these um, anthropogenic changes uh, change the communities, and then how do these changes in communities really alter the biogeochemistry? And so you have many different feedbacks on both microbial scales and on um, higher um, organismal scales as well. So overall, uh, we wanted to emphasize that uh, biogeochemistry in the 21st century really has the opportunity to integrate many fields, and this has been emphasized in this session as um, in other talks as well, that this interdisciplinary approach really can help improve our understanding of, of organic carbon cycling from terrestrial to aquatic systems and the communities that depend on these systems. Thank you. All right, now Joe Kirschvink will tell us about magnetism in organisms and maybe even some magnetic personalities. <laughs> we will try hard. <laughs> well, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, what, where's the pointer, by the way? Oh, oh actually, this would be better for the mouse. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, in the brief eight minutes that I'm uh, going to speak today, I want to tell you that Earth's biosphere is really, truly magnetic, and I mean it magnetic. Um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, well, first I'll acknowledge all the funding agencies that supported various aspects of this work, not all knowingly, including more recently DARPA. Um, <clears throat> But what I want to briefly talk about is the fact that Earth's magnetic field goes back presumably to the early Archean or maybe even Hidean. Life is just about as old. And one of the th amazing things that has been discovered in the last few years is that life is adapted to it by deliberately making crystals of magnetite, ferromagnetic materials. It responds to the geomagnetic field. And not only uh, does it respond to the mag magnetic field, it's been in involved in sensory processes. So, mag and that's through this process of magnetite bond mineralization. So first, unequivocal evidence that the magnetic field controls biology, magnetotactic bacteria. This is uh, from the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Uh, you can move the magnetic field back and forth and these organisms obey. It's magnetic. That's from turning the magnetic field. And of course, we know what the basis is. Uh, the basis uh, are chains of magnetite crystals that are, why isn't that running? Oh, this is a problem if this is, hmm? Well, it worked uh, previously, all right, anyway. <clears throat> but um, anyway, they have magnetite chains. Uh, they uh, don't need to be magnetized. They're automatically ferromagnetic. They're inside the crystals by biochemical processes. We have about 50 genes now that we know directly control shape, morphology, production, iron transport, and they're really, really tiny. So and the question is, when did they evolve? Because of the genomics revolution, we now know that these things are really basal to the bacterial domain. Bacteria that don't have it have lost it. That's the fundamental takeaway case. And we can show that because we have now, particularly in the Natrospiria, gene complexes that uh, are associated with it. And those genes have inverted themselves and stayed that way for the last three billion years. Uh, we can put them on a geological time scale if you squint a bit. Uh, they, the magnetotaxis had to arrive before the Nitrospiria and the Proteobacter. So that puts it back somewhere in our kin, definitely before the GOE, 
back about three billion years. It also is a constraint on the magnetic field biologically. And in fact, there's a whole symposium now running right now over in the Marriott on in the geomagnetism, paleomagnetism, and electromagnetism on this whole topic, which I should be at, anyway. Um, <laughs> so we, we can put this on the tree of life. That's at least where the magnetite biomineralizers evolved. And who knows, it may have even been involved with the origin of life. Basilinsky, 10 minutes ago in the other session, described hydrogen uh, biochemistry in these bugs, which may actually be one of the most primitive metabolisms. So it's fun. So what about the rest of the tree of life? I'll get there. Uh, protists to animals. We know that eukaryotic protists also make magnetosomes. You can see them here in the bottom corner. Beautiful structures, just like the bacteria. Uh, we also have enigmatic things in the fossil record. These are what we call magneto monsters. Uh, they're single magnetite crystals sculpted biologically. And in some organism, maybe a protist, who knows, they produce little spheres of these things protecting an interior cavity of about three microns. They're wild. We also know that animals make magnetite. It was discovered in 1961 by my mentor at Caltech, Heinz Lowenstam. Polyplacophorin mollusks make their teeth out of magnetite. And yes, you can drag the teeth with a magnet. Absolutely clear example of biomagnetism. We also know <clears throat> that um, <clears throat> um, animals make magnetite, uh, salmon do. Uh, animals use the magnetic field. This is typical pigeon. If you release a pigeon from a magnetic anomaly on a clear day where it has a sun compass, it's confused. Flat magnetic env environments there. If you release them on, oh, oh okay, and so, all the geophysicists here know about the marine magnetic lineations. Turns out they're guiding animal navigation in marine animals. Uh, we figured that out over 30 years ago by looking at where cetaceans strand. Turns out they do it at magnetic anomalies. If you make, uh, zoom in, the red dots are where the big strandings occur. If you just plot the magnetic anomaly along the coast and then show where the strandings occur, unequivocal association with large magnetic anomalies hitting the coastline. They use it for navigation. We also know that animals use it as magnetite. We can do a trivial experiment where we pulse remagnetize them. All the magnetists here would love it. You can make bird, uh, bats go the wrong way with a simple magnetic pulse, boom. Uh, anyway, uh, we also know that magnetite is ancestral to the eukaryotes, uh, probably through mag magnetics. So in the last two minutes I've got, I'll talk about humans. Here's our human going down there. <laughs> uh, we put him in a chamber, and in, oh, in fact, the manuscript on this is in bio archives if people are interested. Uh, now, uh, this is the experimental setup at Caltech. We have a similar one in Tokyo. We actually record the brain waves. The reason we record brain waves is because the alpha waves respond strongly to stimuli. So the question is can we make the alpha waves collapse with magnetic stimuli? The answer is yes. And we've discovered two rotations that do that, a toggling a vertical uh, magnetic field or rotating a downwards field counterclockwise produces extremely strong uh, effects. And the effects are seen in time power diagrams. This is the blue blob is the alpha wave drop. Magnetic stimulus here followed in the, la in the next second or so afterwards by that. We can use this to test the mechanism. We know it's not electrical induction because if you toggle the magnetic field this way, with a vertical down component, you get a huge response. If you toggle it with this field upward static, same DBDT, there's no response. And I'll show you a movie on this. I hope this movie runs, please. Yes. Okay, the magnetic stimulus is now. The, look at the bottom left. That's the brainwave collapse from the electric stimulation, or from the magnetic stimulation. But the top one didn't do it because it's not electrical induction. We can also test another mechanism that's been proposed, the quantum compass, free radical pairs. Uh, quantum can't tell axis. So if I compare a downward toggle to the front with an upward toggle to the back, um, the quantum compass cannot tell that difference. So here we go again. Uh, again, same type of thing, different, different subject. Uh, stimulus there, up into the no south and down into the north. And again, down into the north reacts strongly. Humans have the magnetic sense that animals do. Uh, 
So, and we know what the sense organ is, magnetite. Um, so I put the tree of life here to conclude. Probably mitochondrial uh, endosymbiosis brought it from bacteria to the eukaryotes. And it's all over the place now when we have it. So thank you very much. These are the simple conclusions. Humans are also part of Earth's magnetic biosphere. And I'd like to thank the team and the funding agencies that made all this possible. All right. Now, our next talk, in case you didn't realize that it's a microbial world, Mary Firestone is going to tell us about that. I've been introduced, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity to remind you that in fact this uh, sphere that we live on is run by the microorganisms. Um, I was charged with uh, describing the uh, advances in microbiology over the past hundred years that have been important to the advancement of biogeochemistry which was almost a funny topic. So I decided to try to pick five uh, discoveries or advances that in some way were critically important or representative of other types of advances. And so those five examples that I'll talk about um, have to do with nitrogen fixation, which of course was not discovered in the past 100 years, uh, anaerobic methane oxidation, nitrous oxide production under aerobic conditions, creative means of moving electrons around, and the roles of microbes in production and persistence of long-lived organic materials. So we'll start with nitrogen fixation, clearly a topic that we've known quite a bit about for thousands of years. Uh, Chinese writings document pretty good understanding of the use of azola in uh, the su sustaining rice cultivation. Um, the Romans wrote about uh, the use of legumes. So the importance of nitrogen fixing plants or organisms has been highly recognized for a very long time. Our understanding of this bacterial and archaeal process Actually, the advancement of it over the past 100 years is a nice uh, representation of the advancement of microbiology, but I won't document that here. Only to say that the, uh, our understanding of the limitations and the requirements for nitrogen fixation has enabled our understanding of nitrogen fixation in terrestrial, aquatic, and marine systems over the past 100 years, as well as allowing a tremendous expansion of food production worldwide. The global distribution of nitrogen fixation has, has been pretty well documented, as shown here, uh, tends to uh, overlay, to some extent, regions of NPP. The second topic I wanted to talk about was anaerobic methane oxidation, which some of you may have chosen, some of you may not. But I remember it clearly, actually. Uh, in the mid-70s, Bill Reberg presented isotopic evidence that suggested that methane was being oxidized in the marine water column in under anaerobic conditions. It was very difficult to explain. We had no microbiology to explain this, and we couldn't even come up with the thermodynamic framework to fit this process in. There seemed to be microbial catalyst, but it was terribly murky. Slowly, over time, we began to fundamentally understand it was microbial, but it wasn't, generally anyway, a single organism catalyzing uh, methane oxidation under anaerobic conditions. It is a nice example of where microbes have to work together, sometimes syntrophically, but at least in a consortia. This was one of the early uh, publications 
showing the um, coordination between uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria and methane-oxidizing bacteria, and quite important in marine systems. This topic has followed up with uh, the use of manganese-4, iron-3 as potential oxidants for um, methane, um, all of which was totally non-predictive because we, we understood methane oxidation required the presence of molecular oxygen, and clearly you don't see molecular oxygen here. So it's been extremely interesting microbiology, and it has been quite important, I think, in understanding the global methane cycle because in marine systems, the combination of anaerobic methane oxidation an aerobic methane oxidation in the upper profile of the oceans is a relatively effective biofilter to methane that is produced, uh, such that probably about 80% of the methane that is produced from bio seeps does not, uh, from uh, geological production of methane, does not make it out of the ocean. Nitrous oxide production under aerobic conditions. Um, about 1970, 1980, we had a pretty thorough understanding, we thought, that nitrous oxide was produced under anaerobic conditions through denitrification, um, in a process in which nitrate re basically replaced oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor uh, with N2O as an intermediate in, uh, in the reduction process, N2 as a terminal product. But then evidence for N2O from nitrification in soils, as well as in marine systems, began to accumulate, and the microbiology became pretty clear from isolated cultures and from work with the enzymes. We began to understand that during ammonium oxidation to nitrite, um, N2O was produced during uh, oxidation of hydroxylamine and uh, through reduction of nitrite. Um, Although, to get that far, to get to hydroxylamine, these organisms required the presence of molecular oxygen. So it required reduced oxygen availability. In terms of biogeochemical perspectives, um, it didn't change our, our overall understanding because we needed to have reactive nitrogen and we needed to have lower oxygen conditions. But it made our understanding of how, when this happened, the conditions under which it happened, and how we would measure it uh, quite different. Creative mechanisms for moving electrons to and from redox active elements. Um, we first discovered the use of electron shuttles, and that was organic compounds that could pick up electrons from bacteria, transfer them to uh, mineral surfaces, iron oxides, and more recently, over the last 20 to 30 years, actually, extensive work on the use of nanowire conduction. The roles of microbes in production and stabilization of organic matter. We know in this diagram that the solid lines are known to be biotic or microbial. And what the uh, interesting work now is looking at is how much of this transfer to stabilized situations or stabilized has uh, microbial components. And this shows a small fungal hyphae associated with kaolinite. Look at the red box. And if you look at it in SEM, uh, you, we can find that the hyphae is encrusted in uh, kaolinite, and we find that that hyphae is transporting carbon from the roots. So of greater general importance than any specific discovery or group of discoveries is the implicit integration of microbiology into geosciences. The question asked no longer really is, do we need to know about microbes, but rather, what do we need to know about the relevant microbial processes? Thank you. Now, um, we'll come to the terrestrial ecosystems. Beauty Pond's going to tell us about that. It's kind of where we all live. Uh, thanks, organizer, for this uh, special uh, session. I changed a little bit of the title. I'm going to show how those uh, different methods uh, contribute to help us to understand the terrestrial uh, carbon sink. 
Uh, I start from this most recent global carbon budget. For the last decade, on average, the fossil fuel emission uh, was 9.4 gigaton, and another 1.5 gigaton are emissions from land use change, mainly uh, in the tropicals. So the 4.7 gigaton remained in the atmosphere, 2.4 absorbed by the oceans, and the terrestrial residual sink was 3.7 gigaton carbon. However, 16 DGVM models simulate the land sinks to be a 3.2 gigaton. So that's about half gigaton carbon imbalance uh, in the land sink. So our study, uh, the independent estimate based on the, the, uh, the inventory uh, data and the ground measurement, observed the carbon density had increased in all type of forest and then all continents. So the, for 2000 to 2007, that's 2.3 gigaton carbon sink in the forest, which was comparable to the entire terrestrial residual sink for that time. So the terrestrial residual sink has become much bigger, increasing from 2.3 gigaton to now 3.7 gigaton over a decade. That's more than 60% increase. So recently, there are quite a few remote sensing-based uh, study suggest globe is getting uh, greener, which shows the LAR on most of the land surface um, has increased over the last three decades. So for such a uniform increase in the carbon density and LAR, the only likely candidate for such a global driver actually is the CO2 fertilization effect because of elevated CO2. So to understand the global carbon budget, it is essential to understand the terrestrial response to elevated CO2 and the feedback. Um, to gain the insight, one of the important approach is through this manipulative experiment of CO2 enrichment, which were designed to investigate the response of intact plant community to high CO2. From those e e experimental data, we found actually there's a very close relationship between the enhanced LAR and enhanced above ground NPP. So the implication is that enhanced LAR could be used directly to quantify high CO2 impact on terrestrial productivity. So to test it, uh, we used, uh, we applied the, the modis based LAR data from 2000 to 2015. Because LAR you know, changes annually, we use the five years average for the beginning years and for the ending year to look LAR change over the, uh, the period. So for 11 years, um, LAR on average uh, increased by 9%, while AMPP increased by the 18%. So the the most increase by ratio occurred to northern forest, dry regions, edge of desert, and also subtropical shrublands. So this table shows you know, the, the MPP increase in the different bombs. We use modis-based MPP estimate by Zhao et al. as the uh, baseline for the early 2000s. Um, uh, and we also use their ratio of above and below ground MPP for different bombs. So we can see the great uh, increase in annual MPP occurred to evergreen broadleaf forest, uh, open shrubland, uh, wood, woody uh, savannas, and savanna, uh, and grassland. So the total increase in annual MPP over the period is about 10.4 gigaton. As shown by this figure, actually only small portion of annual MPP will end up to become carbon sink. Based on 
flux data and inventory data, it is about 13%. So which means that uh, for a decade, that's 1.2 gigaton carbon increase in terrestrial carbon sink. So last slide is about the potential terrestrial carbon sink. The trend shows that the global forest lands has you know, continue to shrink. If we could stop tropical deforestation and leave those forests to sequester the carbon, we could gain 1.7 gigaton carbon. By improving forest management and including uh, the, the deforestation, we could get another 1.8 gigaton, gigaton carbon. So the currently, the terrestrial residual sink uh, was 3.7 gigaton. So altogether, the potential terrestrial carbon sink is about 7.2 gigaton carbon, which is more than three quarters of current fossil fuel emissions. I think this uh, potential tells us there is a great mitigation opportunity by using terrestrial ecosystem to reduce atmospheric CO2 and slow down climate change. Thanks. Thank you. Now, Gordon Bone is going to um, converge climate and ecology. Well, thanks. For, um, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give my perspective on biogeosciences. What I want to do in this talk is weave together themes related to climate, uh, ecology, forests, and appreciation for history. And so, if we look at the sort of the one of the outcomes of biogeosciences has been to broaden our perspective of Earth as a system. The traditional view of climate, for example considers fluid dynamics and atmosphere physics. But the broader perspective considers the biosphere and its uh, ecology and its biogeochemistry and recognizes that ecology is as important to climate as is geophysical fluid dynamics. The outcome of uh, uh, the biogeosciences perspective is actually seen in the evolution of our models from physically based models of climate to these earth system models, which include the terrestrial ecosystems and marine ecosystems. These are the models that we're actually using to test uh, predictions and uh, alternative pathways for a sustainable future, the socioeconomic factors that are, are driving climate change. But something that's not really necessarily appreciated by these models is that they're very important for scientific discovery. This is how we're identifying ecological processes that determine climate. Things, for example, of, such as uh, photosynthetic temperature acclimation or triose phosphate utilization during photosynthesis. How important are these for our carbon cycle climate feedbacks? They're also very good for advancing theory, testing the general, generality of ecological theories at the macro scale. For example, concepts of about stomatic conductance and different ideas of stomatic conductance. In this talk, I don't want to review this evolution of these models over the past 30 years. I've done that. I've talked about why we need to model the biosphere and how to model this biosphere in uh, several reviews and books. What I'd like to do in this talk is, in the spirit of the AGU centennial, is look at some long-standing research topics that actually go back and precede the founding of AGU. Uh, two of these were the influences of forests on climate, and the other one is the organization and dynamics of forest ecosystems. These are very central to the formation of uh, meteorology as a science and also ecology. They're very prominent topics today. And in fact, they actually it shape our views of the Earth as a system, our models of climate, and our models of ecosystems. So the first topic is forests and climate. With the European settlement of North America, there was widespread deforestation. And there was much interest in how that was changing climate. A popular view was the deforestation was moderating winter climates. There was also interest in deforestation as reducing rainfall. And then that led to this idea that if deforestation decreases rainfall, then planting trees should increase rainfall. But in the mid-1800s, as meteorology was beginning to evolve as a science, and meteorologists were looking for physical explanations for weather and climate, they rejected this notion that the biosphere uh, influences climate. 
Of course, today we now see there's much interest in forest and forest management for planting, for uh, mitigating climate change. There's much interest in this uh, in the popular media and public imagination about these nature-based solutions. Uh, the past three days here at AGU, we've seen lots of talks about that. And so the interest in it continues today. One of the seminal moments in this for me was the development in the mid-1980s of the simple biosphere model by Pierce Sellers and the biosphere atmosphere tra transfer scheme by Bob Dickinson. These models conceive of ecosystems in terms of a series of resistances between the land and the atmosphere and the exchanges of radiation, turbulent energy fluxes, water, and momentum. Out of these models, we sort of developed a view of how, how forests influence climate and this notion of climate services, where, for example, you see strong solar radiation absorption by forests but you also, that heats the surface, but you also see evaporative cooling uh, by the forests. And you can see, for example, tropical forests have moderate warming from solar radiation but very strong evaporative cooling, where boreal forests have very strong solar heating and weak evaporative cooling. But of course, this is looking at it from a biogeophysical perspective. We also have to consider the carbon cycle, and that's where the ecology comes into play. And again, if we go back to the very foundings of ecology in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were these two divergent views of what an ecosystem is. One of them, promoted by, uh, by Clements, was this idea of organism, ecosystems as superorganisms. They have emergent properties and are a d distinct level of ecological organization themselves. The other was this notation, the opposite end of that spectrum was this idea that ecosystems are just individual organisms interacting among themselves and with each other and their, their environment. And indeed, it's out of this debate that the term ecosystem was actually coined uh, as part of this debate. We can see this in our, our, our models of ecosystems today, these different spectrums. There's the uh, superorganism concept, which is show, shows up in our biogeochemical models. These models see the ecosystem as a series of interconnected pools and the flows of carbon and nitrogen and other uh, elements through the system. They are the predominant view by which we model ecosystems in our Earth system models. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, you see this Glissonian view, this individual-based model that sees e ecosystems as just individual plants or trees. It emphasizes demography and life history characteristics of these individuals. Just sort of as a word of caution on this, you know, the biogeochemical models actually date back to the International Biological Program in the late 1960s and 70s. They were seen at that time as being too large unnecessarily mathematically complex, too many unknown parameters, but biologically simple. The individual base models were a reaction to that. They actually evolved at the same time. They're seen as more authentically, e ecologically authentic, but we don't, they're not yet been implemented in the global models. And perhaps these uh, ecosystem demography approaches is going to provide the bridge between the two point approaches. So what I want to lead you with, leave you with is two thoughts. One is this old view that the biosphere doesn't matter to climate is really uh, uh, outdated. We know it's untrue, uh, but at the same time, we're struggling to actually say how forests can be managed for climate services. Here are just two recent papers that came out and uh, have very different views of whether we can or cannot actually manage forests to uh, mitigate climate change. The final point I want to leave you with is we're breaking down these disciplinary barriers. We're on the path to doing that, but I think we still have this air, we're still in this world of sort of what I call dis disciplinary chauvinism, where we're actually sort of talking acro across one another, not among different disciplines. But I would say that it's for our, our understanding the future of the earth, uh, it's imperative that we continue to move down the biogeosciences perspective and take this interdisciplinary approach. Thank you. All right, next, uh, Richard Feely is going to uh, tell us whether or not we should really worry if our um, global marine ecosystem is going to OD on acid. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, I, what I'd like to talk about is some new research on the uptake of anthropogenic CO2 into the global oceans and its overall effect on acidification, how that works. And I'll end up with a, some discussion of the effects in the biology. So, as you all know from the Keeling curve, we are seeing the release of anthropogenic CO2 into the atmosphere and the uh, tremendous impact that it has on our climate. This is the Keeling curve in red here. Also, I show in, in uh, green is the PCO2 off of Hawaii and the pH. And so from obser observations alone, we can see the acidifying, acidification of the oceans from the uptake of anthropogenic CO2. Now, recently, we have just submitted uh, a Gruber et al. paper to science to show what the recent uptake of the uh, ghost ship data set, which is on the bottom, this is 30 years of data of looking at the uptake of anthropogenic CO2 in the oceans. And what we see now is through 2010, of about 159 petagrams of carbon uh, have been taken up by the oceans. It does so by taking up uh, across the air-sea interface. And then in the uh, high latitudes, it's moved to the ocean interior by mixing of the mode and intermediate waters downward into the intermediate depths and transported towards the equator. So you can see this very high inventories in the ocean inventory in the subtropical regions. And it does so in all three ocean basins. This is an example of some very high quality data of the changes over time of PCO2, DIC, pH, and aragonite saturation on cruises that were taken every year by our colleagues from the J Japan Meteorological Agency. And what I wanted to show you is in the tropical regions, the pH change is on the order of 0.001 pH unit per, per uh, year and that the aragonite saturation shows a decrease. When you move from these highly buffered tropical regions to the northern regions, you see that the pH uh, decrease is nearly doubled. So we are seeing a gradient, a south to north gradient in the rate of change due to the, the uh, uptake of CO2 and the changing buffer capacity of the oceans. And that trend is seen throughout many of the ocean basins. This is a representation of that uptake of anthropogenic CO2 in the Pacific Ocean over time from 1994 to 2007. And you can actually see the uptake in the, uh, uh, across the air-sea interface, but you can see the penetration in these mode and intermediate waters at depth, and you can see that buildup of anthropogenic CO2. Now when you do the same kind of representation for pH, you see that, again, you see the uh, changes in pH in surface waters over time, but you also see an intensification of the pH change uh, near the, the North American coast and the South American coast, where we are uh, close to the oxygen minimum zones. And when you see that intensification, this is an example of the fact and the impact of hypoxic and hypoxic, uh, hypoxic waters and oxygen minimum waters with acidification, which is enhancing the acidification effect. And that enhanced acidification is very significant in these regions, and it's building up from the ocean interior as a transport mechanism and interacting with those low oxygen waters. We will see the same impact of this enhanced acidification on all of our coasts where we have hypoxic conditions along our coasts, which we will have a more rapid change in acidification and a more extent of change of acidification in these hypoxic regimes. So we need to take a very careful look at that, not only along the coast, but in our estuaries, which are often under hypoxic conditions. This is a, uh, a model representation of pH on the top and, and aragonite saturation on the bottom, starting from 1770 using the uh, global PCO2 data is the data input combined with GFDL 
ESM2 model to look at the global changes. And what you see is very dramatic changes in pH over time, but they're uni more uniform uh, by region. There are uh, changes in, in the Arctic and Antarctic region, but not nearly as much as a strong variability of the change is as we see in aragonite saturation. In fact, with aragonite saturation, the, at the end in 2100, we're still seeing supersaturated conditions in the tropics, but undersaturated conditions in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So there's differences that we are seeing in the different carbon parameters of importance. Now if we switch over to the biology, there are many, many biological experiments that have been done in the laboratory in the field. And we, a lot of our concern with the biology has been in the uh, coastal region. This is because many of the effects of ocean acidification will affect our eco ecosystems along our coasts, which are of economic importance to this. But also along the coast, we have other competing effects, multi-stressor effects of warming and hypoxia and respiration processes that are occurring. So it creates a complexity, which means the variability be higher, but the overall signals we should be able to see. For example, the signal of pH, the time of emergence of pH in the open ocean, about 10 to 15 years, time of emergence of, of pH in coastal regions is generally between 20 and 40 years. This has socioeconomic importance because of the effects of the acidification on these ecosystems and what does that mean for the economic health of our coastal system. Along the west coast, this represents at least 3,000 jobs and uh, somewhere around two to four billion dollars of economic activity. Here are some brief examples of biological effects we see in the ocean right now. We have an impact of ocean acidification right now on oyster larvae and pteropods, and we are seeing responses in laboratory studies to uh, effects of CO2 on salmon. So very key species are being impacted. Uh, this is the overall impact on a global basis for different groups of organisms. The red shows negative effects, the green shows positive effects. This shows the economic importance of acidification to the global uh, fisheries, and by the end of this century, we would see uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of two billion, $200 billion of economic impact up to that amount uh, per year because of acidification. And so we have a choice. We have a choice between reducing CO2 emissions. This work by J.P. Cattuso shows what the overall impact, if we reduce CO2 emissions, we would only have mild impacts in most of our fisheries. But if we choose to go at the RCP 8.5 CO2 emission scenario by the end of the century, most of our uh, uh, fisheries would be severely impacted. So that's a significant choice that we have. This is what we are doing about, we're developing a global ocean acidification ne network, and there are now 67 nations involved with this network to combine our resources and understand this problem. So in conclusion, 28% of CO2 emissions ends up in the oceans, and we are we're already seeing a 30% increase in acidity. By the end of the century, the acidity will increase from 100 to 150% under an RCP of 8.5. At the current rate of acidication is 10 times faster than anything we've seen over the last 50 years, and the biological effects of acidification are occurring now and will become, become more severe on our RCP 8.5 scenario. Thank you. Hey, apparently our understanding of budget sciences does involve some data, and Bob Hazen is going to tell us about that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here as part of this session. I want to tell you something about deep time data-driven discovery using Earth and space and life sciences, growing data resources, applying analytic and visualization techniques that allow us to probe those data in higher dimensions and to understand uh, Earth history as a consequence. Um, 
I want to do four things. I want to briefly introduce the DTDI program. I want to use two examples that rely on network analysis of Earth history. And finally, make a brief plea for open access data and fair data practices. So the, we have three objectives in our efforts. One is to look at minerals and other condensed materials, which are the most robust preservers of the history of our planet, trying to understand how those vary in uh, diversity and distribution. We want to compare this with other planets and moons, and of course, look at the co-evolving geosphere and biosphere, so integrating various types of data. We give you an example. We have three main thrusts. One's called mineral evolution, which is looking at the variation of Earth's minerals through deep time, which is largely a biological consequence, the diversification of minerals. We use, as in all these efforts, large and growing databases. We rely on the University of Arizona's rough database for this aspect, particularly the mineral evolution database part of this, which is something that's been uh, de developed over the last eight years or so at the University of Arizona. We can then take these data and look in various aspects. Um, you can see a diagram like this, which shows the mineral evolution of nine different first row transition elements. On the lower left is the chronology, going back four billion years. The vertical scale shows you how abundant those various minerals are um, for the different elements. And then the colors indicate the redox state of the minerals, which also indicates changes in atmospheric oxidation. Uh, we do mineral ecology, which is looking at the diversity and distribution of minerals across the globe. And we try to apply methods of ecology, biological ecology, to understand these distributions. Here we rely very much on the MINDAT data resource, which has over a million mineral locality pairs. We're able to do statistical analyses of distribution, make frequency spectra, just like biologists do, of, say, of a forest ecosystem, and are able to do accumulation curves, which allow us to predict minerals that have not yet been discovered and described and point mineralogists to places they can go. And we've already been finding, for example, a lot of new carbon minerals using this effort. And we also are using uh, network analysis, work pioneered by Shauna Morrison, where we look at different combinations of minerals or fossils or, or other entities and try to see their relationships amongst themselves. So looking at communities of, of minerals in this particular case. So for example, here's Dan Hummer's work on manganese minerals, and it's very, very striking. We see patterns here we wouldn't expect. In the upper part of this, you see a little cluster of, of manganese minerals that are associated primarily with igneous rocks. Off to the side, there's another little cluster associated with manganese metamorphic minerals, but the big sort of cluster down there, which includes the more oxidized phases, those are the, um, the critical zone manganese minerals, largely biologically influenced, and we see more oxidized phases in that. You can do this with virtual reality, by the way. It's, it's really fun to go with virtual reality glasses and see, see these. So that's the DTDI. You can go on our website, dtdi.carnegiescience.edu, to see some of the things we've been working on. What I'd like to do now is introduce two specific examples of how this can be applied. In paleobiology, we, of course, rely again on large data resources, PaleoBioDB, and our colleagues, uh, particularly Andy Knoll and Drew Macente at Harvard U University, have been working on the idea of looking at networks of fossil organisms. Here is a network diagram showing all the coexisting animal families over the last 500-some million years. And you'll see that they divide themselves very neatly into the oldest Cambrian fauna, the Paleozoic fauna, the modern fauna. There is a timeline built into this, even though we included no age information when we made the network, but the timeline just falls right out. We also see mass extinction events. And so you can use these networks in rather creative ways. You can also have this as an evolving network diagram. These are trilobite genera. And up in the upper left-hand corner is the actual age. So we're hitting about 500 million now, and it goes down 1 million years at a time. And you can follow the evolution of biological systems this way and also see mass extinctions very clearly. What I want to focus on is, though, the recent really extraordinary work on the Ediacaran, where we haven't got quite as much fossil coverage, but Mike Meyer and Drew Macenti put together a huge database um, of all the known Ediacaran fauna. They're experts on this field. And they basically build a network of this. This is a preliminary one. There's a more advanced one that I can share with you if you'd like to see it. 
and it shows the earliest Avalonian, the White Sea, the Nama faunas, all recognized as distinct. There's some overlapping faunas, but it turns out there's mass extinction in this. And in fact, more detailed analysis suggests that there are two mass extinctions in the Ediacaran that we're now able to tease out and give some character. So ask me about that if you'd like to know more. The second thing I want to tell you about is, is about the coevolution of geochemistry and biochemistry, something that people have thought a lot about, and especially our colleagues at Rutgers University, led by Paul Falkowski. In this particular case, we see that the ocean chemistry has changed systematically over time. This is something that's been known by a lot of people, Ariel Anbar and colleagues, for example, have looked at this. Iron has decreased over that period of time, manganese increased slightly, and then copper increased quite a bit more in the last uh, a few hundred million years. And so we look at the change in oxygen, like Tim Lyon showed us earlier today, and we also look at the different oxidoreductase enzymes. These are the ones that do electron transfer. They typically have a transition metal. The most ancient ones have iron, then manganese comes in more recently, and then the most recent ones, copper. So there's a sequence, iron, manganese, copper, which reflects geochemistry. You can do this also by doing uh, trees of microbial organisms, and again, the most ancient ones uh, use iron more frequently. Manganese comes in a little bit later in these trees and copper most recently. What I want to show you in the very last slide has to do with now with protein structure, something that seems completely different. This is work by Jana Bromberg using the Protein Data Bank at Rutgers. And this is quite extraordinary. This is a network diagram. There are three things you need to know. Each node in this, and there are about 6,000 of them, represents a protein structure. The links, those lines, represent proteins that have the same function in an organism. And finally, the spacing represents how similar or different the structure right around that metal active site is. So if two structures are very similar, they're close together. If two structures are very different, they're far apart. That's the only thing that goes into this network. After Jana Bromberg makes this network, she then colors them according to which metal appears within that structure. And here you see iron at one end, you see manganese and copper. There is a timeline built into this. This gives us the opportunity to probe the evolution of proteins using a very different sort of approach. I think that's a really exciting development. Finally, just very briefly, I want to put out a, a shout out for fair data practices. We need to have open access data. We need to share it. This is the only way we can move this field forward. With that, I thank my funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, what kind of planet would uh, respond to life? Uh, well, um, this one. So every shock will tell us about that. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is maybe a slight change of topic from where we've been, but I want to um, give some uh, framework for uh, why there might be life on a planet uh, at all. Um, and one of the reasons for thinking about this is the revolution, that scientific revolution that we're all undergoing right now, which is the uh, relentless discovery of exoplanets and <laughs> the amazing things that we're finding out about these worlds and we're trying to, of course, figure out where should we look if we're going to see evidence of life beyond our own solar system. And of course, we're looking for life throughout our own, own solar system as well. But this is definitely a driver for uh, thinking about how planets support life in the first place. Um, there's a nice image of the accretion of Earth. Um, I'm old enough to have taken this picture. <laughs> But there's the point. The planets tend to start out hot. Um, heat dissipates uh, slowly by convection. Um, and so the heat part of the energy is relatively easily lost by planets. It takes a long time. Uh, but it still uh, is, is, is lost through convection. Um, the compositional part of the energy, though, uh, gets stuck. And we get chemical energy. Um, uh, uh, 
gets, uh, the dissipation of the chemical energy gets inhibited by various mechanistic problems. Metastable states, states form. We're all familiar with seeing things like igneous minerals at the surface of the earth, where they obviously didn't form, but they're loitering and lurking around, waiting for something good to happen. And that energy, that part of the energy, uh, initially, of course, coming from planetary formation, is, uh, stays unreleased unless catalysis can enter in. And here's a, uh, a nicely out-of-date uh, view of life on the planet, but nevertheless, this uh, cartoon helps to illustrate what's uh, the point I want to make here. We are trying to think about life throughout our solar system, and we're trying to think about the potential for life on exoplanets, and we have our one example. We have one planet we know of with life, and what the history of life on our planet tells us is the use of chemical energy before the use of, uh, of uh, photo, uh, use of sunlight. And so all the green branches on this tree show organisms or groups of uh, various phyla that uh, have developed um, uh, the capacity to do photosynthesis and the black part, and especially down around the center, these are all the things doing, uh, getting their energy source from, uh, from chemical energy. So they're, they're actually, we don't have any evidence that from life that it emerged at the surface of the Earth. And if we accept that fact, then we should be thinking of life as a geologic phenomenon that has emerged, perhaps, from the inside. So these chemotrophs are just like you and me, living by catalysis. We capture some of that energy that is released by the catalytic process. Um, the chemolithotrophs, of course, are using inorganic energy sources, and the, um, they emerge. Uh, apparently, in our one example of life, let's not lose track of that, <laughs> they apparently emerge in response to planetary opportunities. Eric Boyd and I considered this our uh, number one pr uh, geobiochemical principle, that life emerges as a planetary response. And what is it responding to? It's responding to that. That's a model of, of course, representing mantle convection, but it's the dissipation of heat, the slow convection of the interior of the Earth, the uh, chemical consequences of that that keep things going. This, of course, uh, map showing us the plates and the plate boundaries is another response of a planet to mantle convection. And I'm, my claim here is that life is a response to this as well. This sort of blow up from an encyclopedia view, uh, we should take that as serious metastability generators. This is the Earth recycling its surface conditions, which is essential for maintaining life uh, over the long term of the Earth. I couldn't give this presentation without any content, uh, so I decided to include some. So here is a, um, a diagram that I'm going to take just a moment to explain and show you the consequences of. This is a plot of the oxygen fugacity as a function of temperature. You can think of the oxygen fugacity as just a way of keeping track of the oxidation state. More oxidized going up, more reduced going down. You see a red dashed curve on there labeled FMQ, that's phalite magnetite quartz. That's a good reference frame for thinking about what igneous rocks at the Earth's surface are capable of providing in terms of an oxidation state. There's a black curve on this diagram that separates, that's the equal activity curve between CO2 above that curve and methane below that curve. So if we were living in a world of stable thermodynamic equilibrium, we would have predominant, the carbon would be predominantly in the form of CO2 above, predominantly in the form of methane below. All those curves up on, on there are uh, calculations of the consequences of the reaction of water uh, and when rocks in the olivine plagioclase system um, showing, so this would be appropriate for gabbros, ultramafic rocks, gabbros, basalts, showing that the trend of water rock reactions is such that it would drive carbon initially across that line from the oxidized side to the reduced side. So up here at high temperatures, um, we had see a, a transition when, with water rock processes that go from C uh, methane synthesis being disfavored at high temperatures, not because it's hot, but because the system is too oxidized. Below the about 400 degrees, we see conditions where the earth itself is trying to push carbon to a mo more reduced form. Um, this seems to happen in an equilibrium uh, state down to about 280 degrees. Um, 
And there's great lines of, ev of evidence, most recently from the clumped isotopes. And so below about 280 degrees, the Earth is trying to push carbon towards methane, but the reactions are really slow. In fact, they are slow on the age of the universe. As a result, we have a zone here where organic compounds uh, the, the drive is for, that the Earth is trying to do is to push carbon into the form of organic compounds. And of course, down at the lower uh, temperature part of this region, we know that there are methanogens uh, thriving at least to a temperature of 121 degrees um, who are doing exactly that. And they, the reason these are autotrophic methanogens making themselves and methane from the CO2 and hydrogen that the Earth hands them. And they are just the living manifestation of this drive that the Earth is pushing carbon towards organic forms. I see I have a red light. Let's go back to the surface. Meanwhile, we seem to be preparing the surface of the Earth for what I call the technophiles. These are not people who are obsessed with technology so much as they are the organisms which are engaged in evolving their enzymes right now to deal with all the pleasures we are giving them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what a long, strange trip it's been. Um, now we'll be prepared to be amazed by Biogeosciences, along with Dennis Baljaci, the uh, former editor-in-chief of JGR Biogeosciences. Well, well, thanks, you all. Um, this has been a wonderful um, session. I really been, enjoyed it and really learned a lot from it. Um, for today's talk, I kind of took Dork's um, charge a little bit maybe um, literally and trying to wrap up all the connections that we've had today. And today's talk will be based really on my 40 years of experience measuring and modeling uh, trace gas fluxes by teaching a, a biosphere course with Jill Banfield and also serving as editor of, of JGR. One of the big picture questions we all need to ask ourselves really when we think about the biosphere is how it functions, how it metabolizes, going back to, to Vernadsky. And so really we want to be able to understand the breathing of the biosphere essentially. And, and, and this is really a, a big, big challenge for us because this operates over what, 15, 16 orders of magnitude. So the challenges that facing us are really as large if not larger than rocket science it's on the order of neuroscience. And I also like to Trust based on many of today's talks is that we want to understand this breathing of the biosphere going back three billion years essentially and understanding how it's changed over time being controlled by the chemolithiotrophs into the phototrophs essentially. So since I only had eight minutes I thought I'd just kind of follow Dave Letterman's uh, lead and try and give you what I thought is the top five uh, findings that have amazed me in, in biogeosciences. And with it, you'll see actually a reading list that I think is really fascinating, too, as we move along. The first thing is we work with a complex adaptive system that has emergent scale properties. And with that, there's scaling. There's order to this biosphere, which is amazing. And if you go look at West's work, Peter Reich's work, others, much of the function, the traits of life follows these power laws. And you look at these power laws, there's lots of zones where nothing exists, but you follow up and down these lines. And if you're trying to model this system and you need priors for Bayesian models, this is a great way to start. Recently, my students and postdocs were also looking at some of the soils of the world. And I was shocked to even see that the carbon-nitrogen ratios of the soil follow these similar power laws. I, I pulled out the data from Betness, and we have our new data from the Delta uh, in, the, in the San Francisco Bay Delta. So you have 40% uh, percent carbon of the soils, that ties really with the nitrogen. So there's stoichiometry that's involved here also, essentially. Number four um, is really this co-evolution of computers, instruments, data storage systems that have allowed us to do what we have. Um, of, those of us who are old enough are really amazed to see how the technology has changed. Um, in our early years, we used rudimentary computers, uh, Osborns even, let alone the IBMs. We had to collect our data on 360K floppy disks. We had to be out in the field every moment we collected our data. Our sensors were not waterproof, and so we had to wrap them up if it was going to rain. So we had these really patchy measurements with noisy sensors that drifted. It was crap, essentially. 
And today it's wonderful. I'm taking data as I talk to you here. I have like nine flux towers that are operating. I'm working with the FlexNet network. So we have hundreds of data sets being collected right now because of the advances of, of this technology, essentially. And in my own world, our work's advanced a lot by just the idea of tunable diode laser spectrometers. They can allow us to measure directly from first principles, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, stable isotopes. Sue mentioned also the advances with accelerator mass spectrometers. Uh, Estella talked about uh, ground penetrating radar. I mean, all these things have really changed our way to probe and look at the biosphere. And to me, this is, is astounding. Well, where does it take us? Well, we can actually start measuring the metabolism of the biosphere on ecological time scales and space scales. I've talked a lot with uh, Pat Krill over the years with the chambers and stuff. And you know, in the old days, we had a small footprint. With the eddy flux, we can actually measure the population of this whole room of your breathing, essentially. And we can do it from day in and day out. And then working with colleagues like um, Marcus Reichstein's group, Jingfeng Zhao and others, by pulling together sparse networks of flux towers that are representative with gridded climate data, with satellite remote sensing, and tied together with advances in mathematics with uh, neural networks, regression tree statistics, we can now start mapping the biosphere at pretty high resolution on almost a week by week, month by month basis to look at these data. So these, this is you know, data generated. and gets back to the role of the importance of sharing data. If we didn't share the data, we couldn't even do this. So again, this is another revolution we're, we're facing. Number two is looking back at the breathing of the biosphere from our colleagues with the ice cores. This amazes me when I teach my biosphere course. You can see from ice age to interglacial period, time and time again, CO2 went from about 180 to 280. 180 to 280. Well, that's, what's that tell you? The biosphere and the atmosphere pools changed by about 100 petagrams of carbon. That's 10 to the 15th uh, grams of carbon, we say a petagram. If you look at the rates of change over time, this is on the order of teragrams per year. You heard some talks earlier that we're actually having the biosphere take up about two petagrams now. So the biosphere between the glacial and interglacial periods is it was operating at a completely different rate. We're actually operating on steroids. And I guess the question I asked maybe Jude uh, Yud Pans is, can we have capacity to even upgrade this even more if we're already maxing our capacity, if we look at this from a historical perspective? And so finally, I think what really impresses me is this whole idea of this co-evolution of life, the composition of the atmosphere, its impact on the climate, and vice versa. I think you've heard this clearly described throughout today from all these wonderful talks. Um, I was lucky as a postdoc, I got to go to a meeting in Oak Ridge and sit across the table from James Lovelock when he was just pushing the Gaia hypothesis. And more recently, I had a copy of um, Wally Broker's book on how to build a habitable planet. These are really great readings. They build on these ideas of Vernatsky and, and others. And it really gets back to we're even able to be here because of this role of microbes building oxygen and, and really leading to the first cyanobacteria that led to the early oxygen. But even that, it took a long time because all these chemical reactions you saw earlier with Tim Lyons' um, talk. One thing that we haven't mentioned so much also today was this role of the early oxygen led to the iron rust formations that you see in Australia. It led actually to ice-covered earth, snowball earth, which happened several times, leading to these feedbacks of the biosphere atmosphere. And all because of the rock cycle and plate tectonics, we were able to blow out of it and build up enough greenhouse gases that more complex life could form and we could be here to yabber at you and stop you from having lunch. <laughs> so we're almost done. Um, really, we have to do think about this role of geochemistry and, and um, microbes. Oh, I teach ecosystem ecology with Wendy Silver, and she likes to argue microbes rule the world. And I, I, I do agree with that for the most part, but as a biometeorologist, I still feel we have to think about photosynthesis that produces that carbon that the microbes eat, essentially. So I think we've had a wonderful field. Uh, we build on the legacy of von Humboldt, Vernatsky, and others. What we do is really hard, and we need all of us working together to really do it. And we can't do it without really new technology and working together and sharing data to really look at how the biosphere breathes. So thanks. All right, thank you for coming. As you probably figured out by now, this is the centennial year starting this
fall meeting. Next fall meeting is the end of the centennial of the year, but it's not all about the fall meetings. Um, there are other things going on. Tell your story in the narratives, if you like. Um, you can even get a grant from one to $10,000 from AGU to help promote um, science communication and get your story out there and engage with the broader community. Um, posters from this session and this morning's whole sessions, both of them, are this afternoon or right after lunch. By all means, come down and check it out. And we'll have more time for discussion, questions, and, and not only with the poster presenters, but with the speakers as well, as well as section leadership. Thanks again to all of everyone. Let's give all the speakers another hand.